listening to the Heartland Author Podcast. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. For today's episode, I had the honor of interviewing Andrea Wilson Woods. Andrea is the author of the book Better Off Bald, A Life in 147 Days, which is about her late sister's battle with cancer. Unlike most interviews I've done, the list of questions I used during the interview were from a PDF file that was downloadable from the book's website, and I'll link to both the book's website and Andrea's website in the text description of this episode. I'm here with Andrea Wilson-Woods, the author of a book about uh, her uh, late sister who had cancer. I believe it's called Better Off Bald. Uh, Andrea, welcome to the Heartland Author Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Erin. Now, who are you and what do you do? (laughs) That's a great question. Well, I'm on your podcast, so clearly I'm an author. I'm also a speaker, a patient advocate, and a podcaster myself. Now, how did you get in this field and I understand it was due to a life event yes absolutely so when I was 22 I was living in Los Angeles I had graduated from USC and my eight-year-old sister came to visit me for what was supposed to be a two-week Christmas vacation and this was December of 1994 And that turned into a permanent stay. I ended up becoming her legal guardian. So like I said, I was 22, she was eight. There was a 14 year age gap. And I raised Adrian all through my 20s. And then one month after her 15th birthday, she was very unexpectedly diagnosed with stage four liver cancer, also known as hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC for short. And she had very few symptoms, which is not uncommon with that particular type of cancer. Um, But it was stage four, it was metastatic. This was 20 years ago, and there was not very much they could do. And so despite doing numerous rounds of chemotherapy, her actual cancer journey lasted 147 days. Now, what motivated you to write Better Off Bald? I really wanted to tell her story. I I always thought, well, first of all, I'm a writer. I love to write. And I always thought that I was going to tell our story, our sister's story. This was not the story I thought it was going to be. Um, so it turned out very differently with, with her getting and then subsequently dying from cancer. Um, but I, I wanted to tell her story. You know, I don't know anyone who could have handled that diagnosis better than she did. And she was 15. And, you know, she just had so much courage and grace and dignity and humor. And... I wanted to share that with the world. And also while Adrienne was sick, she very much wanted to get out and educate people about liver cancer because there are so many misconceptions, especially back then. And so it was also a way to share her story, but but share, you know, what it was actually like. And so in the book, you not only hear from my point of view as the caregiver and the parent and the sister, But about chapter three, I introduced Adrienne's point of view because she was a writer too. And she had started an online journal long before she got sick. I never read the journal to respect her privacy. And I started reading it a few years after she died. And I realized that when when it came time to write the book, I had to include her point of view as well. And so by chapter three, Um, Each chapter starts with her actual words. What do you hope readers take away from Better Off Bald? I hope readers are inspired. I hope they have a, a real understanding of what this does to a family, especially 
in such a short amount of time with with a stage four diagnosis of cancer, I purposely put all the details in there. And that, that has been some of the criticism of the book. There's too many details. But for the most part, people really like the details because they feel like they're living the story with us, which is exactly what I wanted. I also hope people realize that life is short and you don't know when your life may be cut way too short like hers was. And Adrian really just sort of sees the day and she created a bucket list. She didn't call it a bucket list. I didn't acknowledge that's what it was, but it, that's what it was. And she made a list of all these things she wanted to do. And almost every single one of those things happened because of her. It wasn't because of me. She was the driving force. And probably the, the highlight of, of all of it was she, she was a music lover and her favorite band was Jane's Addiction. And she loved Dave Navarro, and she was actually able to be meet Dave Navarro, not once but twice, and and that was, you know, that was huge for her. It was like the highlight of her life. Now, having lost your sister to liver cancer, which is an aggressive disease, and I understand she was diagnosed at stage four, where it's. Uh, where the uh, odds of survival are extremely slim, do you find it difficult to uh, balance expressing yourself and the magnitude of her experience without invading her privacy? I don't. I was very deliberate about what I put in the story and what I did not put in the story. I think it was Mark Twain who said something like, it's not what's in the book, it's what you take out of the book. And so I feel like I did a good job of telling the whole story, but also respecting her privacy. In your memoir, you write about watching uh, your sister Adrienne's condition deteriorate over what was a short period of time. Readers are along for the journey with you as you move through the stages of grief and ultimately come to terms with having to part ways. Can you tell us a bit about what this journey was like for you and lessons you learned along the way? Yeah, so I feel like I had to live in a very healthy state of denial to get through each day. I could not allow myself to accept that she was going to die, really right up until just two days before. I, I just, I, there was no way I could have functioned and been an advocate for her if I had accepted that. I definitely went through uh, bargaining. <laughs> God was not listening, I tried, and I was certainly depressed. You know, it's interesting because anger is one of those stages of grief. And, and I did not feel angry until many, many years later. And I'm happy to tell you how that happened. But, you know, I, anger wasn't a place that I went to. So I was in denial. I was depressed. I bargained. And, you know, I don't think even I fully accepted it until much later. And so the book ends with Adrian's burial and the acceptance part of not having her in my daily life, that came much, much later. And that is what the next book I'm working on right now is about. It's about grieving all through my 30s and and not having this amazing presence in my life and no longer being a parent. Now, uh, you're familiar with looks and uncomfortable questions that you inev inevitably feel from strangers who are trying to come from a good place <laughs> yeah. after you've uh, lost a loved one. Are there things that you feel are better left unsaid when talking to someone with cancer or their loved ones? Absolutely. During that cancer journey, one of my friends said to me, it was during a phone call, and I think a lot of people say this, God only gives you what you can handle. And I was so furious because if you take that statement, regardless of your religious beliefs, just take that statement to its logical conclusion, 
then if you're a strong person, God's going to give you hell. <laughs> and, and that's ridiculous. It truly is ridiculous, right? And, and so, you know, when people say these things, I think they're trying to make themselves feel better because they don't know what to say. And another one is, especially after she died, um, she's no longer in pain. She's in a better place. And, you know, I've met other, other parents who've lost their children. And again, regardless of your spiritual or religious affiliation, none of that makes people feel better, especially so close to the death. And I always recommend the best thing to say, and it's very simple, is I'm sorry for your loss. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. And, and if, if the person is a hugger and you're a hugger, give them a hug. But you don't have to feel, fill in the gap of silence that's going to exist. You don't. There's nothing you can say to make the situation better. All you can do is just be there for the person. But when you come up with these trite statements, it just, at least for me, it made me feel much worse. What are some of the best and worst things to say and do when our loved ones are hurting? When times are tough, how can we find the right words in the right moments? Well, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten in my life, and I didn't understand it at the time, but I totally appreciate it now, is we are taught to treat people the way we want to be treated. And that some people call that the golden rule. Well, I can tell you right now that doesn't work because that's how statements like God only gives you what you can handle happen because that's what the person would want to hear. So instead, treat people the way they want to be treated and some people call that the platinum rule and that is just it's so critically important the other thing i would add is that if you say you're going to be there for someone you better be there you know you better be there and it's much better to say i can do x y or z for you if that's helpful versus i'm here for you because I'm here for you is, is too broad. And when someone says they're here for me, that to me, that means, okay, anything goes. <laughs> you know, absolutely anything. It means I could show up on your doorstep at two o'clock in the morning and you would let me in and not ask any questions. And I certainly have a few friends that I, I call them the 2 a.m. friends who are like that. But for the most part, you know, especially your neighbors, your community, they, they don't know what to do or say. and offer to help um, and, and find out what that person needs. And it's possible in the moment they might not know what they need. Yeah, uh, my dad died very suddenly from a, a sudden cardiac event uh, about two and a half years ago. And I made the mistake of, being, of going into too much detail about how I found him dead, and I had noted that uh, oh. uh, it, it upset some people because I noted because the only evidence of physical trauma was when he hit the floor in, in his garage, uh, one of his teeth became dislodged, and there was no blood. Yeah, usually when someone loses a tooth, there's a lot of bleeding in the mouth. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah, and that... Uh, creeped uh, some people out <laughs> well not me i promise um and, I, and i'm i'm so sorry for your loss to to go back to my own advice i i really am uh, my book goes into a lot of detail about the moment my sister died what happened immediately afterward and i know just from reviews that i've read that you know, people tend to bawl their eyes out, but they also say that they learned something, you know, that they, they and they, they felt it. They felt all of it. And just recently, in fact, a woman 
who um, whose husband was was dying from metastatic liver cancer. She had just finished reading my book, and she and her husband had a great weekend. He was still very physically active, and he had made a very conscious decision the year before to stop treatment because the treatment was was worse. And so he had been on hospice for a long time. He woke up on a Monday morning and his speech was garbled and he was unsteady on his feet. And she knew from just finishing my book exactly what was wrong with him because the same thing happened to my sister. And so she immediately called the hospice nurse instead of an ambulance and said, you know, he's not getting enough oxygen. Can you please come over right now? And sure enough, overnight, his oxygen levels had dropped to 70%. And he died a few days later at home in their bed with her holding him. And, you know, that just touches me. I'm getting emotional, but that just means so much to me that she knew exactly what to do. And, and so I also feel like my book can really help people if they ever encounter a serious illness like cancer and have someone and they're, and they're the caregiver for that person. Now, as you were a caregiver to someone who was terminally ill, in many ways you were walking this person to a threshold they haven't wanted to reach. What have you learned about how to broach the subject? I wish I had broached the subject. There's a moment in the book and like I said, the chapters are introduced with Adrian's point of view. There's a moment where I thought she was getting better. She had had her fourth round of chemo. We had no problems, no complications. She wasn't in any pain whatsoever. And even before we got the scan results, she knew she was getting worse. And so what I tell people now is to have that death conversation before you get sick, especially with adults. You know, I, I'm not saying have a death conversation with a teenager, but have that conversation because I wish I had had that conversation with my sister. I wish she had been able to tell me that she knew she was getting worse. But as protective as I was of her, she was even more protective of me. Now, uh how does one go on living when they learn that they're terminally ill? Well, if you follow my sister's example, you do everything you have always wanted to do. You meet your favorite rock star. You go to a ballet and, and sit in the orchestra in the first row seats. Um, you go to medieval times uh, and experience all of that. Um, you just, you do everything you, you've ever wanted to do. I mean, I can tell you right now, um, I should probably knock on wood, but <laughs> if I were diagnosed with a terminal cancer tomorrow, I would book a trip to Italy because that's at the top of my bucket list and I am not going to die without having gone to Italy. Yeah, I would have a completely different approach I would be just more concerned about keeping uh, the house in uh, good enough order for the estate auction or whatever. <laughs> I don't really have a bucket list. You know, I, I will add this too. It, it brings great comfort to me. Let me back up and say my sister and I had the same mother, different fathers. Her father died before she was born, so she never knew him. So. The, but that brings me to my dad. It brings me great comfort to know exactly what my dad wants, exactly what his final wishes are. He has, of course, a will, which is about property, but he also has an advanced directive, which is also called a living will. And that's about his actual medical preferences and choices. And, um, and he has everything from his funeral to where he wants his ashes spread. And as an adult, that makes me feel good. I know exactly what my dad wants. So when the time comes, I can honor his wishes. And I think that's one of the, the best gifts you can give someone. I know a woman who 
her mother was slowly dying from COPD over a period of years. And her mother planned everything. And she and her sister were so relieved because all of the decisions had already been made when their mother passed. And they knew that all of those decisions were exactly what their mother wanted. And, and I, I think, you know, most of us, we, we want to honor our loved ones when they die. We want to honor the dead, but sometimes we may not know how. Now, uh, you write about uh, tragic experiences that marked your life, but Better Off Bald uh, actually has some humor in it and is not a gloomy <laughs> or brooding book. How do you do that? <laughs> I think it helps that humor is one of my core values and humor for me includes joy and having fun. And I feel like I taught my sister that as well, you know, and she was so funny. She had just the absolute driest wit. Um, and a great example is we were at her favorite restaurant and she the two of us and two other friends and she was having a hard time eating she was at that point where she had just gotten very thin and it was hard to keep food down and one of the things was when she lost her hair she never lost her hair follicles so she didn't look like a, a typical cancer patient with the shiny head she still had eyebrows she still had eyelashes and so on a good day when she looked healthy when she had some color in her cheeks you had no idea she was sick and and this was one of those better days so she was sitting there kind of just stirring her soup and I had noticed this best boy eyeing her I mean he just could not take his eyes off her and he was probably 19 or 20 and he came over at one point and he said you're so beautiful he said, I, I, I mean, I, what made you do it? I, I, you, you're so beautiful, bald. What made you shave your head? And without missing a beat, like like the spoon was, was midway to her mouth and she didn't look at him or anything, she said, I have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and this poor kid was had probably 10 plates and I thought he was going to drop them all. And he scurried away and she looked at us and she said, he won't be back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, she, she, made it, she made it easy. It was really important for us to laugh. How did you re manage to remain open to love in the face of fear? Oh, that's a good question. And, um... Love is everything, right? I mean, love is everything. At the at the end of the day, it it, it really is. Um, I'm not saying I haven't made some some bad choices in that respect, but our our relationships at the end of the day are very important, whether they're romantic or friendships or family, and I think you have to remain open. You know, I don't want to go through the rest of my life sad. Now, I have to have a question about how this uh, particular question was worded. And it says, what was it like to be the parent of a child who was seriously ill? And uh, was that child uh, one of your biological children? Or was it your sister that you became the legal guardian of? It was my sister. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was my sister. Um, and it happened so fast that it, it was almost like we didn't even have time to process it. I mean, it, it was, I came home from work, she was curled up, curled up in a fetal position crying, and this is a kid who never cried. Normally when I came home from work, she was at the kitchen table doing her homework because that was an, a rule in our house. And it, we went from that to her pediatrician to the ER and it was the ER doctor that night who told us that she had tumors in her liver and lungs. He sent us to Children's Hospital Los Angeles 
Two days later, she had a biopsy. Less than a week later, she was doing her first round of chemo. That's how fast it was. And there are pros and cons to a fast diagnosis like that um, or to, to waiting to hear for weeks and even months for some people. Um, yeah, it just, it just happened so fast. It was all we could do just to keep up. What should one do when they are overwhelmed by grief? Do you have any suggestions for people in those first moments or weeks of dealing with a loss? I'm so glad you asked this question because it is the focus of my next book. And I did a, a talk earlier this year for a church and the people who were grieving felt like I didn't give them the perfect answer. And, and I felt so terrible because there is no perfect answer. Um, all I can say is you have to feel those feelings to heal and you can't worry about other people and what they think. And you really do have to take it one day at a time. Some, sometimes you take it one hour at a time. I'm so embarrassed to admit this, but it is true. I remember there was a day and I had not gone back to work yet and it was also near the Christmas holidays and I was lying down on the couch on my side and I watched eight hours of Lifetime. <laughs> Four Lifetime movies in a row. I think I got up once or twice to go to the bathroom and eat ice cream and that was it. And that's okay. I think I think you have to be really, really kind to yourself and, and just know it, it's okay. Whatever it is you need, it's, it's okay. Um, people are going to give you a lot of advice. Take what works for you and dump the rest. Uh, are there any rules around who one is allowed to grieve for and is grief related to proximity? You know, I don't think there are are any rules, but and it's and it may not be related to proximity, but I do think there's this this little bit of and this is why I stopped going to a grief support group for parents of one upping people. Like it becomes competitive. You know, I was sharing the story of my sister she died at 15, but she wasn't my biological child. So my grief was clearly not as bad as the other couple over here who's one and a half year old drowned in their pool. You know what I mean? It, it felt very weird and competitive. And, and so I don't think there are any rules. I know many people grieved the loss of my sister in their own ways. Um, I was told later that when she died it was announced at her high school the next day and the counselor opened her office and many of her friends went to the counselor's office and many of them just went home that day they just left as soon as they found out because because the actual word had not gotten out from from me or anyone else yet um and as far as proximity you know i, I don't know I, I think it just depends i think you can grieve someone you've never met and that's okay. I feel silly saying this, you know, but Prince is my favorite musician of all time. And I was really devastated when he died and how he died. I just couldn't believe that he died alone at his home in an elevator. I, I just, it was hard for me to kind of wrap my mind around that. I never met Prince, unlike my sister who met her favorite rock star, right? But I did grieve his death and I participated in a lot of events the following month after, after his death that honored him and, and that made me feel better. And the first time I ever really grieved a celebrity was, uh, I was 11 years old when Dale Earnhardt Sr. was killed in the uh, Daytona 500 in Iraq and uh, even though he was not my favorite NASCAR driver, uh, the way he died uh, yeah it just uh 
a mass, uh, no, it was a basal skull fracture he suffered in a, a, a race car wreck. Yeah. Was uh, uh, just heartbreaking. And also there was a controversy over, uh, I think it was like some college newspaper in Florida tried to get his autopsy photos and what? published them in the... <gasps> that's why there's a, a state law now in Florida that uh, uh, autopsy photos can only be made public under certain limited circumstances. That's terrible. Oh, my God. Oh, gosh. You know what? You brought up an interesting point. There's also, I feel like, this thing about how someone died. You know, my sister's death was tragic. Um Dale Earnhardt, right? Uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr. Sr. Tragic. But then when someone dies, let's say, natural causes and they're 90 years old, everybody's like, oh, well, it was their time. (laughs) Well, you know what? Someone's probably missing them a lot. Someone is probably grieving that person. And yes, they had a long life, but, but that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are, are grieving that loss. And, and I think that's one of the challenges. And I feel like, you know, I can't speak for other cultures, but at least here in America, we don't talk about the fact that we are all going to die. So while you, you personally, and I mean sort of the general you, not you, Aaron, may not experience the death of your child, we're all going to experience loss at some point. It's going to happen. You will know someone who dies. And I can and, tell your dog's upset. I know. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Clearly, the mailman is here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? Pets. I love my pets. Uh, one of the things that really helped me with my grief was I got the dog I had always wanted. This this was quite some time ago in 2002, a year after my sister died. I, I got my English Mastiff. He was the best dog ever. I knew he was going to die one day. He lived 10 and a half years, which is a long time for that breed. And I was crushed by his death. I mean, just crushed. And it took me another four years before I was ready for another dog. And I still have his ashes you know, in this, this giant oak container because he weighed as much as an, a man. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we're not only grieving people, you know, we can, we can grieve animals. Now, how was it for your family to be written about in your book, especially your mom? Oh, well, hmm. (laughs) You know, one of the things, before I directly answer that, and I will, that I I feel like a lot of people get from the book, if not consciously on a subconscious level, I love stories. And all stories have one of three themes. Either it's man versus man, man versus nature, or man versus himself. And there can be overlap. And I think when you pick up my book, and read the book jacket. This is this is just man versus nature. This is a young woman versus cancer. But when you get into the book, and again, it might even be subconsciously, you realize it's actually man versus man. It was Adria and I versus our mother, because a lot of things came out about our mother during Adrian's cancer journey, terrible things. And it was also man versus, in, in this case, herself, because Adrian really came to terms with a lot of anger that she had toward our mother for abandoning her and toward her father for dying. And and so all stories have, have those, those themes, at least one of them. And as far as writing about my family, I made some very conscious choices. Almost all the names in the book are changed, especially all the medical providers. But I did not change my mother's name. And I did not change certain family members' names. And right after my book came out, um, someone told my aunt, my mother's sister, about one line in my book, mind you, one line. And my aunt did not speak to me for three years. I just saw her for the first time on Thanksgiving. 
uh, hadn't seen her in three years. I still have a cousin who somehow manages to post multiple negative reviews of my book on Goodreads. <laughs> she just keeps creating new accounts. It's her every time. I mean, she still she still uses the same picture, um, and and she's offended. And, and, and what's funny is that she's not even in the book. <laughs> I, uh, there's actually, I think, terms of service rules uh, on Goodreads, which I believe is an Amazon-owned uh, social media service for uh, book readers, uh, against creating multiple accounts and then uh, uh, using them as like alter egos of yourself. Sell, but I'm not right. 100% sure. <laughs> I tried. I tried to kind of deal with it, and then I just let it go. You know, I was like, if she's going to be upset about one line in a book, in a book where she's not mentioned at all, you know, all, all that tells me is I think she was upset she wasn't mentioned. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my mom, when I wrote my uh, first book, which was an e-book uh, titled Lady in the Fast Lane, which was some motorsports fiction novella, uh, I told my mom when she bought a copy of it for herself that uh, she could not review it because she's a close relative to me, and she left an honest review, a four-star review anyways. <laughs> you, you know, you bring up a good point for all the authors out there. I, I had a lot of early reviewers, you know, I gathered a lot of people and said, as soon as it goes live on Amazon, please leave a review. But for every person who had a personal relationship to me to stay compliant with Amazon's terms of services, I said, you have to reveal the relationship. You have to say, I know Andrea, da, da, da. And, and actually there were a couple cases where my sister's friends reviewed my book and, and they revealed the relationship. I am actually, I was, you know, a high school friend of the subject of this book. Now, if someone were to recommend your book, Better Off Bald, to a friend, what would be one thing that they could say? Oh, gosh. I think one of the, my favorite things that I've read from someone I didn't know was that my book is both heartwarming and heartbreaking. And, and it really is balanced that way. And that, and that was a choice I made. And, and also, I've read a few reviews where they say, you know, yes, cancer is the, the driving force of the story, but this is really a love story between two sisters and what unconditional love looks like. And I love it when people get that from my book because I, I've never loved anyone the way I love my sister, ever. Now, what are you working on right now? I think you mentioned a little bit earlier in uh, the interview that you're working on another book. I am. I'm in very early stages, the, the, the fun research outline stages, but um, I'm working on my that time in my 30s when I was grieving and some of the good and some of the bad choices I made, including marrying a man who, while we loved each other, he was not the right guy for me. I, I mean, I, I had second thoughts walking down the aisle and I went through with it anyway. And, and so that's what the next book is about, is about grappling with, with grief and, and the decisions we make during that time. Your uh, nonprofit, which is called Blue Fairy, that's spelled F A E R Y, is named in memory of your sister. Yeah. What services does Blue Fairy provide for liver care cancer patients and caregivers? Well, Blue Fairy, well, first of all, thank you for spelling it that way correctly. Um, we chose that spelling because that's the spelling my sister preferred. And Blue Fairy's mission is to prevent, treat, and cure primary liver cancer. So again, that's hepatocellular carcinoma through research, education, and advocacy. And so we have an annual research award we give away every year on my sister's birthday on April 8th. 
Um, we have free patient education materials in multiple languages that we ship worldwide. Uh, we have a private online community that is truly a private online community that's HIPAA compliant. It is not a Facebook group. And patients and caregivers get a lot of support there. Um, and we have all kinds of advocacy efforts. So uh, last year, I think it was last year, uh, we started a new program called Love Your Liver. And this was to really focus on the prevention aspect of liver cancer. So it's a public awareness program. Uh, we did it once last year, twice this year, next year, funding, permitting. We, we are doing three separate campaigns, and it's really going into, well, how can you prevent liver disease and liver cancer, and what are the risk factors, and targeting the people that are at highest risk, because liver cancer is this, this very odd cancer in the sense that it's a disease within a disease. Most cancers aren't like that. So most people who get liver cancer have an underlying liver disease. And sometimes the treatment for that underlying liver disease is not the best treatment for the cancer itself. And so it can be very complex to treat, yet, and it's actually one of the most common cancers worldwide, yet it's one of the most preventable cancers. And so there's just a real lack of education and we're trying to tackle that. What do you hope to achieve with your new endeavor? Now, I understand this is not an actual higher education institution, but it's called Cancer University. Right. What products or services uh, does Cancer University provide that help the cancer community? So, Cancer University, or Cancer U as we call it for short, it's an online platform for all cancer patients and caregivers to really educate, empower, and engage them to become advocates for their health care, to improve outcomes, lower stress, and reduce cost. And it came out of a need I was seeing in my own organization in that, you know, I know our patient education materials are stellar, they're easy to understand. As I mentioned, they're in multiple languages and they're free. But what I was finding over the years is that people would get our materials whether by mail or they would download them and that's kind of like giving people the what but not the how and when i was raising my sister i was a teacher and later i became an adjunct professor and a certified coach and so i have been coaching patients and caregivers pro bono for over a decade and it just got to a point where it was unsustainable and yet i didn't want to charge people either and you're often saying the same thing, even if it's a different cancer. Um, so it, it really was just the spark of an idea, trying to solve a problem. I entered a very prestigious international competition and got in the semifinals, and that kind of gave me the momentum to move forward with Cancer University. And, and we also have a podcast associated with that. Okay, well, what is the name of the podcast that's associated with the Cancer University? It's called Cancer Youth Thrivers. We just celebrated 100 episodes. A new episode drops every Tuesday and the last Friday of the month. And each week I interview cancer patients, survivors, caregivers, um, or providers um, about their cancer stories. Um, and and we've covered so many different kinds of cancer it's been amazing well andrea that was the final question so i thank you for appearing on the heartland author podcast oh well thank you aaron so much for having me to everyone who has lost a loved one to cancer i am sorry for your loss this is aaron apollo camp reminding you all to write your imagination bye for now You can learn more about me and my book writing projects at camparenapollo.witsite.com forward slash author AAC. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook at author AAC and on Instagram at AAC Scribe. Copyright 2022, Aaron Apollo Camp, all rights reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. 
Any reuse or retransmission of this podcast episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.